So I, what I'm interested in with the recovering the magisterial tradition is to challenge the, you know, general assumptions, which are, as I encounter people, there's basically two buckets anyone has, which is like normal or theonomist. And so I have no bucket, you know, they, but they're just told, okay. And theonomy bad, right? Obviously that's like most people. Um, so it's to, it's to broaden the Overton window to where it traditionally was. Mm -hmm. And it's also to shake people out of their assumptions and force them to, to ask themselves why they think certain things when it's incongruent with the, the testimony of the tradi tradition, which by the way, was well thought out by much smarter people and exegetes than we can be. Welcome to this Reformation and Revival video. I'm here with my friend, Timon Klein, uh, who I'm finally, we actually are finally meeting in person, yeah. which is nice. We have been uh, dialoguing back and forth through various forms for a very long time now. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we actually finally get to meet in person. You've been on Reformation and Revival before. I have. Uh, yeah. Timon is an attorney, and he is also um, an associate editor at American Reformer. That's right. yeah. And you're also a fellow at the Craig. Center? Craig Center. The yeah. Craig Center at Westminster Theological Seminary. That's right. Yeah. What do you do? At the, what is, what's the Craig Center about? So the Craig Center, full title is uh, Craig Center for the Westminster Standards. It's a, uh, you know, scholarly center that's run by Chad Van Dixhorn, who's an expert on the Westminster Assembly. So it's dedicated to research and scholarship having to do with the, the assembly uh, in okay. the broadest sense possible. A lot of Puritan work and um, so a, project, a couple of projects I'm working on there have to do with very ele various elements of Puritanism, uh, natural law theory, and, the, and church and state during the Westminster Assembly. So those are some long-term research projects. But we have uh, monthly seminars where scholars come in and talk about relevant research, um, and uh, otherwise it, it funds you know particular scholars. That's what it's dedicated to, and so I've been involved with that for a couple of years now, I guess. Um, and it's, it's a good excuse to keep keep spending time on that kind of research. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then American Reformer, you want to give word? What's American Reformer about? Yeah, American Reformer is a, um, well, first it's an online publication, online journal dedicated to um, Protestant social thought, you know, something that, that needs to be uh, recovered and further developed for Protestants. And, and by social thought, I mean political and uh, cultural uh, dialogues, you know, d discussions and, and arguments that are all being presented by Protestant, generally reformed authors, although we have had some diversity in our in the people we've published, um, but it's generally re reformed. Um, so that's the publication side, and we have we have had great authors and tried to engage in in many of uh, not just kind of popular discussions that that happen, but also do a fair bit of our own resourcement to look at older text and older ideas about politics. Um, then there's also a reform arm to it that Josh Abatoy heads up um, that's trying to uh, recover and improve, you know, certain Christ Christian institutions, especially in higher ed. Um, so that those are kind of the two wings of American Reformer. It's about a, it's a little over a year old. The editor in chief has been Dunson. Um, so it's it's doing some exciting stuff and continues to grow. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, today I want to talk to you about how to start a civil reformation. That sounds good. And um, we talk about cultural reformation. We talk about reformation of the church. But you strike me as a good guy to talk to about a civil reformation for several reasons. Um, things are nuts. Everyone knows that. We're post-BLM riots. We're post-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and for a while, you and I were talking and chatting and talking about uh, doctrinal refor reformations yeah. that are associated with what's going on. Um, we have some mutual friends, Andrew Walker over at Southern Seminary, mm -hmm. who I think is talking about civic theism now. Yeah. Um, there's all these different titles that are be. That there's a flurry of titles. Stephen Wolf was just here, and I interviewed mm -hmm. him about Christian nationalism. We've talked about that as well. Um, you, we, then we had the Moscow thing where the MSNBC came out and said, yeah. um, you know, theocracy rising in Moscow. So we're going to be yeah. a Christian town. And which if you get a Christian town, people will be more free than they are now. That's the That was the idea that throws a curveball to all those who are steeped in secularism. Mm -hmm. um, there's other Christians, maybe in the evangelical world, big evil world, that basically have bought into the secular zeitgeist that uh, just think, well, I'll operate with my Christianity within this yeah. secular system, and that's our job. Um, so we're not that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But when it comes to uh, what needs to be done, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We've talked recently, and you say we're in the idea stage yeah. of civil reformation. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit, mm -hmm. why are we in the idea stage? What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of um, you know a depressing answer, but I think it's necessary to uh, 
we're ever going to do anything to just accept and begin to own and work through it. So my depressing assessment or analysis of Protestants uh, in America is that we don't actually possess a thoroughly Protestant, you know, confessionally and historically informed vision for what society should be. Um, even in the American context. And so until we can, this is what I, I'm talking about when I'm saying uh, the ideal stage, the stage is not ideal, it's the, the stage of forming an ideal. Um, until we can figure out what we actually want to get to, or, you know, as the, the Twitter kind of trads will say return, you know, hashtag return, until we figure out what that's supposed to look like, um, you don't know what you're working towards and you're going to continually work from concessions um, which will usually just return you back to the, the conditions that got you to the, the present uh, problem. So until you have the ideal to, to prudently work from and make concessions from that, um, you really have no business trying to go about in, installing a, a reformation because you don't know what you're working towards. Um, so the, we're still in the stage, I think. I think it's, I think it's begun, um, and that's some of the evidence for that is – uh, impassioned energy uh, around certain discussions you just mentioned, right? And some of this is uh, circumstantial, just things that have happened since, you know, past five years, past 10 years that have got gotten Protestants back into thinking about these things, realizing that the stock kind of liberal myths and answers that we have baptized generally are insufficient unless you want your your kids to suffer and your uh, your <laughs> towns to burn, right? Like, there's just no. This isn't going to work. Everyone knows there's a problem. Everyone knows there's now. Pro I think the Christian so. community think, knows well, there's a problem. We might not have a vision, but it's like something's broken. Something's bad. I think most people say that. There's some stubborn people that refuse to admit it. Maybe still, um, but most people know it. Anyone who's who, anyone who's woke knows it, right? So you're woke to this issue. Um, so, the, and one of those problems you're woke to is, is wokeness, right? That would be one one problem, but. Um, there's, there's much deeper and larger, larger societal issues for sure. Um, and there, you could, you could cite many data points to demonstrate this. You already cited a few. And so I think now what, what Protestants who are thoughtful, historically informed and, and reflecting on the, on the present are trying to just begin to do is say, okay, what is the, um, what are traditional conceptions, which seem foreign to us, foreign to us of, the goal, end, and purpose of society, what is the role of the magistrate vis-a-vis -vis the church um, and reformation as a reforming uh, agent, we might say. Um, you know, what is, what's the sort of scope of their authority? What is uh, the role of uh, the good citizen? What's that supposed to look like? So all these things, I mean, these are very basic, fundamental things um, that are usually in, tr in traditional discussions are often rooted in uh, traditional anthropology and metaphysics; those are things that are foreign to most evangelical Protestants. That you have to get then get them comfortable with that before they can begin to understand older arguments for the way we organize society or how we do that. Um, so this is a long, in my opinion, a long-term project. I mean, we should try to expedite it as much as possible. Um, but the, one mistake would be as Protestants, Protestants to think um, just because we woke up a few years ago to the problems that they also just started a few years ago. They're deeply ingrained. Mm -hmm. They've been, uh, you know, sort of You've had this virus for a while. For a now long you're time. showing signs. And now you've got symptoms and you think it started when you got symptoms. Well, no, it's it's been a you know potentially terminal illness that's been uh, dormant uh, or not so dormant um, for quite a while. So it, it, you have to imagine, you know, it takes this equal amount of time to root it out or maybe double the time. I don't know. It's always harder to build. Um, and you're going to have resistance along the way. So I think we should buckle up for the long haul and don't try to, um, you know, don't produce a makeshift civil reformation. Do do the real thing. But you got to know what you're working on before you start doing that. You do need to know what you're working on. Yeah. So let's say, let's just take the group of Christians that see the symptoms. They see that they mm -hmm. have the chicken box. Um, and they're like, we need to do something. Of that group of people that are aware mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. need a civil reformation, um, and we want this to be inside out. We want this to be the word of mm -hmm. God. This needs to be revival. The spirit of God's the only one that can do it. So we're evangelicals. Mm -hmm. You and I, we can speak all of that evangelical language. Mm -hmm. It's going to be through the Bible. It's going to be repenting of sin. It's going to be trusting in Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I want to press into some structural things, but lay that solid foundation first. Sure. Um, of the people that know there's problems, 
I've said there's like a lot of people that are defensive. We have a defensive posture. Mm. Um, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad, but they're not sure how to build. Mm -hmm. well, then we might have people that want to build uh, strictly politically that fall mm -hmm. into the trap of a knee-jerk reaction outside outside in. Let me just get the right man in, in the as, as a governor and then we'll be good. But that's really all that they have. Mm -hmm. um, but this kind of thoughtful, no, this is actually how we should be thinking about structuring society mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Um, in the past, you've called this pro Protestant integralism. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. one one thing which you've written about. You can just search time and climb Protestant integralism. Um, but then we have the Christian nationalism stuff mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. that has happened. Um, those are at least two two visions mm -hmm. uh, that I know that have kind of come out. Mm -hmm. What are the other players? What are the, what are the major visions that are out there? Yeah, I mean, both you know, <clears throat> both of those labels. Um, I think, I think Stephen Wolf would, would agree with this, or, or to some extent intentionally provocative. My, mine certainly was. Um, and sort of accepting things that are already either being batted around or thrown around either as pejoratives or as, as uh, again, provocative kind of proposals, grabbing them and saying, yeah, this could be descriptively powerful. Um, so something, you know, integralism generally is just, which I think is just a sort of shorthand for for early modern, even pre modern political assumptions about uh, the way society and politics work. Um, it's just tapping into to older thought, and you're you're um, of course it's it's focused a lot on church state relations, um, but it's something as basic as say a, a key tenet of integralists today, which are most of them are Catholics. Key tenet would be that the um, you know so politics is not disconnected from the ends of life. It's very simple. But when you're talking about politics, and this is something you can find, I think, in, you know, Johannes Althusius will talk about, you know, politics is just the art of living together. It's symbiotics and everything you're doing as a sociable creature. Um, this is politics. That's This is what we're talking about. So how do you organize yourselves? And when you're doing that, um, it can't disregard what man's ultimately for, um, which, of course, we could say in the immediate term is, is virtuous life, but ultimately his destiny is in God. So when you're talking about politics, which requires government and rulers, they also aren't dis disinterested in those final ends. Um, and you would have uh, someone like Richard Hooker who would say, you know, in, unless you're governing hogs, not men, that don't, you're, unless you're governing something without a soul, you have to be interested in the souls of your people because you, that's a full person. So if your charge is men, you govern men, you're concerned with their soul. Now, there's limits on the, the competency of rulers, of, of temporal magistrates, um, but they're not disinterested. And so a lie that we've told ourselves in the American regime as it stands, uh, at least in the post-war period, is that government should be agnostic towards that. And that uh, you might have some of our friends, some of our Baptist friends say, you know, the only real thing government should do in relation to religion is um, set up a, a fair and neutral playing field for people to duke it out. And the mere pursuit of religion itself is the common good. There's like Russell Moore was talking about a mosque. I want to defend my yeah. the, the Muslims right to build a mosque yeah. in New York City. Right. You could have that or, or even, um, uh, you know, our friend Andrew Walker, his, his thesis of his book, Liberty for All, is, is this. The, the mere pursuit of religion is a good, right? Well, what I would want to say is that if you're going to be concerned with the, the well-being of people, and that includes their souls, which means you're going to have to um, actually care about truth, not everything can just be good for the soul because uh, they're running after it and they're chasing it or pursuing it. Um, then you have to be concerned about what true religion is. And so there's there's an outlet for doctrinal promulgation and policing, more or less, a synodical authority or something like that. And that has to be the church. And so this necessitates, in my opinion, it's inescapable that you need an established church. I think that that's for, for reformation. I think you have to, in some way, now we can talk about various models of this. I think there's loose, I think there's strong establishments, but you have to start making decisions that narrow the scope um, of doctrinal uh, authority and teaching. Otherwise, it becomes very, very difficult for the civil authority to understand how it should care about the soul of the individual, because to whom does it defer? And if there is no decide, you know, if there's no agreement, there's no partnership between um, the, the temporal authorities and any particular spiritual authority, then it's unclear, you know, who, who is uh, making moral decisions for doctrine that should inform our laws. 
Um, and as we know, someone's always doing that. Um, and you might as well go ahead and recognize who they are. And then you need to decide if you like the job that they're doing and who you would replace them with. Okay, so let's talk yeah. about this established church. You say we need yeah. an established church, yeah. right? And uh, as you mentioned, we have friends that are going to remind you about Obadiah Holmes, Baptist, who yeah. was whipped. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to say, you know, who's what? Who's church? And then you're yeah. going to say, you know, who's getting excluded here? Yeah. And the kind of yeah. persecutions that are going to come. So, yeah. what you say we need an established church? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So again, we could, you know, we could discuss the models, and there's always going to be. In, in, when you get to actual implementation, you're going to have to be a prudent statesman. That's that's a, um, a a requirement in any kind of political scenario. But since we're talking about the ideal, the you know if we can talk about the American context in a minute of what maybe you know was there at the beginning. But when I say establishment, I mean a a particular um, I think denomination or at least synodical uh, group. So you know, some, I have a friend that will always say NAPARC should be the you know, the established church in that sense. But so you could come up with, you could have a, a coalition of, of reformed churches, but you're going to have to do, you're going to have to have some kind of narrow identification. So where's it going to be? Is it going to be Protestants generally? Well, then you have an, an issue of uh, when you need authoritative statements, when the magistrate needs to call for a synod to determine a doctrinal or moral issue, how do you organize that? So of course, the simplest and best answer for an establishment is one denomination, um, that has a hierarchy and they're built into their ecclesiology. If you don't have a hierarchy, I mean, I just don't think a, a Baptist establishment is going to work. It's kind of a, an oxymoron for them anyway. So um, simple establishment is is exactly what everyone's a, afraid of, but what I actually think is necessary and we had in many of our, our states at the founding anyway. Um, now, what most people objected to at the time was, was a taxation issue. People don't like being taxed to support the ministers. Um, I'm, I'm fairly agnostic on the taxation issue. I don't think that's a requirement to have an establishment. The only thing I'm wanting or saying is required is a recognized, as in by the, by the temporal magistrates, authority on doctrine and morality um, that can adjudicate these issues to inform it of, um, to inform it beyond its own legislative competency. So the is, civil magistrate adjudicates doctrinal issues. He does not. He does not adjudicate doctrinal issues. What is he? What did you just say? He adjudicates. He defers to the to the adjudication of the church. But with the the um, you know, you can do it. You can do what Constantine does when you know there's an issue. You call the senate. You call the uh, he he assembles it because I asked. He can certainly I, assemble it. Yeah, I asked. Um, yeah, grab his name now. Christian nationalism. Our Stephen. I asked Stephen okay. sitting in the chair. You were in, and I said, "Are you telling me that Joe Biden's supposed to supposed to?" Tell me what to preach, and he chuckled and said, "Yes." Yeah, but he was. Yeah. I think you probably or would he would. I'm assuming there would be agreement here. You're saying yeah. you just want the civil magistrate to be able to call the synod. Yeah, and you know, of course, some I don't see it this way, but some people are going to say the ability to do that is itself adjudication. So, of course, there's a there's a gray area here. I think you just have to be comfortable with that. This is a very traditional formulation. Um, but I, me and Stephen would both agree that that is not. Um, does not mean that the magistrate is determining the doctrine or promulgating it directly. What he's doing is deferring to the church's judgment, that's within their competency, and then reflecting it and furthering it through his law, And so, insofar as it's relevant, right? Um, another reason you might call a synod if you're a temporal magistrate is to say, um, if there's unrest within the church, now this it may not be an issue that pertains directly to a law you're needing to pass or a question you have, um, but you don't you want peace within the church. So the magistrate also has the authority to say, "Hey, you're this is getting out of hand. You need to figure it out authoritatively and promulgate that to the members." Of course, um, now none of this um, eliminates an aspect of toleration. I don't want persecution either, but we also have to. Um, as, as generally liberal Americans, by default, have to reform for ourselves what we think toleration is. And toleration is not pluralism as a sort of value or a virtue. Um, toleration is not equal privileging of all religions. Um, and you even see this in commentary from like Joseph Story in 1833. We'll talk about, you know, even the First Amendment at the federal level was never meant to level the playing field. It's not meant to, to prostrate, he says, Christianity before Islam or Buddhism or anything like that. Um, what it's meant to do is eliminate 
interdenominational conflict at the federal level between Christians. So even in, in our context, that's this is recognized by someone, um, you know, who's an authoritative jurist. But I would say uh, toleration is certainly available for Baptist or whatever. No one wants persecution. But that doesn't mean everyone's equally privileged. And I think if you're, that establishment does not negate toleration um, and, the, and vice versa shouldn't be the case either. So you're looking for an establishment. I'm, I imagine people are going to listen to this. I'd love yeah. from the walk away and, and somebody might Google, you know, church establishment. Sure. And then who knows what's going to come up, right? Who knows? And then that's yeah. going to be stuck, hung on time and Klein's neck. He's a, whatever, sure. whatever they yeah. Google yeah. is what time is for. Yeah. So uh, would you call it, would you, well, would you call yourself a, um, a church establishment minimalist and it, it, whether you did or not, whether you did or not, um, give me the, give me, give me what that minimum is to sure, actually meet yeah, yeah. that term. What, what's the minimum thing you're going to have to have in society to have this church establishment? Bare minimum. Um, I would not call myself a minimalist, um, or minimist, whatever you say. Min minimalist. <laughs> minimalist. Um, bare minimum though, what you'd have to have, I think in our own context. And I think this is, you know, it's appropriate to always consider, um, your, your own country when you're trying to implement, Im implement reform, um, or restoration because it, it suits the people. This is part of being prudent. So one is to recognize, um, our federal model where you have a multiplicity of, um, you know, zones of establishment. When I say the states, right? These these can almost be considered in our in our structure different nations to on this front. Um, so you had various forms of establishment and various brands of establishment. And so you could have somewhere like South Carolina that says in their original constitution uh, that they recognize Protestantism as as their religion and their requirements for civil office ref reflect as much. It'd be um, Protestant to be in civil magistrate in yeah, South Carolina. But just generally Protestant. They don't specify denomination. You have somewhere like Massachusetts that does, of course. You, you The establishment up until 1833 is very clearly congregationalism. Um, and everyone knows the standing order, as it was called, same in Connecticut. Um, it, that's everyone who's running everything, right? These are the people with power. Um, and it's still supported by the parish tax and all these sorts of things. And then you could have... Um, you know, somewhere like New Jersey that never had a strong establishment, maybe a pseudo Anglican one. But when you get to their first constitution in 76, they say, you know, uh, we want to protect everybody's right of conscience. That's not the same thing as action, but belief is certainly protected. And you got to um, be a good citizen after that. And, and then right after that, they're going to say, but only Protestants can run for office, right? That they're, they're the only ones that have full civil rights, is how they put it. And then, of course, you have a an orth, very orthodox test for, for office. So these are various degrees of establishment, right? Mm -hmm. You have different recognition by the state of a religion. And uh, I already mentioned Joseph's story. He lays out basically these three models. You could have one that says this denomination, this sect. You could have one that says this general religion, um, Christianity or Islam, you could have another one that's like, well, Catholicism or Protestantism. So you see these these different degrees. Um, I think at bare minimum, you have to have, for any of this to work, what we had at the beginning of the founding period, which was a sort of pan-Protestantism across the board. Um, I mean, 98% of the people are Protestant anyway. And then you have the majority of the states recognizing Christianity um, at least generally, and most of them are recognizing a version of Protestantism as the standard and the the moral norms by which the state is going to judge things, right? Um, and the the moral standards for your leaders. Now, you might tolerate, of course, you're going to tolerate um, Jews. They're not going to they're not going to be killed. This is uh, made clear from Washington and everyone else. There's only about two thousand of them, but there there's nothing's going to be done to them. But there, it's very clear that in most states, at least, they're not going to be the ones holding power because they're not Protestants or they're not Christians. Um, so you could do that. I think that's bare minimum. And I think that could have worked very well um, for various reasons. Maybe it wasn't ever really tried for all that long. Um, but I'm certainly comfortable not being a minimalist and having a full-throated establishment. Do I think that that would work in the American context to a degree higher than what I just described. No, I don't I don't think it would. I think the return idea, adjusting for present challenges and circumstances and historical development would have to be looking at, I think it suits us to look at things that happened in our country mm -hmm. um, and that's right. what we work towards. And yeah. so, so 
all of that is an exploration mm -hmm. in this ideal mm -hmm. that we said mm -hmm. um, that even the Christians in America who are now woke, they're yeah. they're woke to the wokeness, yeah. they're woke to drag queen story hour, yeah. they're woke to the White House being lit up in rainbow colors, yeah. and they're saying we've we we're doing something wrong. Yeah, we've got that. We've got the virus. Yeah. Um, the first step is not only reacting to Fox News every night and being disgruntled, mm -hmm. but to actually have a vision of what you what mm -hmm. civil reform. If you're going to if you're going to be a reformer, you have to know what it's supposed to look like. And you're mm -hmm. saying this establishment, uh, regardless of what you might look, and there's a lot of nuance. You don't just Google it. You're saying here's what I mean: um, that a state sure. would acknowledge Christianity or yeah. Protestantism, or a denomination, mm -hmm. take your pick, but the state's going to acknowledge mm -hmm. um, Christianity in its mm -hmm. documents, constitution, mm -hmm. and to be a civil magistrate, you're going to be a Christian. This this will yeah, be a... generally speaking, yeah. If you have that, you have a, the basics, at least the minimal of what you're talking about. Yeah. Now, is that right? Okay, so yeah, we... you have some coherence to to all of this, because okay. um, otherwise, as, as you're... The, the sort of... Uh, pictures of the current establishment, the the White House lit up or whatever. There's going to be one, and and everyone knows that there's right. that there's actually tests for office, right? Of course, you can't get elected without, um, at least by by certain party standards, right? Without affirming certain things that are very moral. So this is inescapable. So you might as mm -hmm. well get get serious about it and stop acting like um, it offends some neutral liberal sensibility that you're supposed to have because, in right. fact, that's pious, right? Um, so th th these are inescapable categories. And we used yeah. to do it. So it's not yeah. like we're proposing something that's no. entirely yeah. foreign. And, of right. course, you know, a guy can just say, hey, like on the building it says, in God we trust. Yeah. On yeah. the money it says, in God we trust. And we all know that's the triune God. Let's not yeah. let's not pretend like we weren't talking about the triune God. Right. Um, yeah. So, okay, with that vision, that's mm -hmm. a vision. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. that's a getting that far mm -hmm. is extraordinary. Yeah. Where if you can get Christians to say, okay, I buy that. Mm -hmm. um, now the question would be, you know, um, the question would be, take a, take a state. You're not going to try to do that tomorrow. Yeah. You're not going to go lobby the legislature mm -hmm. tomorrow to mm -hmm. say, I want to make mm -hmm. an amendment. Yeah. Um, you're going to have to be a Christian to be in office. Yeah, that's it's, that's just practically that's a bad idea. Yeah. Um, what are the what are the doctrines? What are the ideas, the truths that the Christian Church in America needs? Mm -hmm. Like A, B, and C as we start this reformation, as we see kind of a groundswell of people that will buy into that vision and actually make some progress. Yeah. So if I if I'm taking your meaning meaning right, I mean one of them would be you're right. I mean the uh, Maybe nothing wrong with it, but you're going to be minimally effective if you go into the legislature tomorrow saying, you know, I need, I need us to, here's an amendment or a, here's a motion to recognize um, the CREC as your, you know, your established church. No one's going to do that. Um, but for the church, we should at least be talking about that issue and how our forebears across the board, unless if, if you're, I guess, if you're actually Protestant or Reformed, uh, certainly believe in, in fact, so often took it for granted that they um, didn't write about it as much as they could. So, I mean, pick your favorite former. He thinks this way about the civil magistrate, about the, the nature of society, about the nature of religion in society. Um, across the board, Peter Martyr of Amelie, whatever you want, go go look at it. It's You're going to find it there. So why don't we think that way? Could you give, me, give us a few more? Uh, Vermeule, sure. Uh, George Gillespie. I mean, everybody at the Westminster Assembly, the debate is simply over the priority of the magistrate or the, or the church at the time. So it's the Erastians versus, you know, some, uh, the Scottish position basically, which I think is pretty classic. Uh, Zwingli thinks this way. Luther actually thinks this way. The whole, you know, the two kingdoms thing has gotten way out of hand. It's, it's carrying water. It's not supposed to. I find that's why I usually don't even use the terms anymore. Um, Calvin thinks this way. I mean, everybody thinks this way. There's, there's, the, the way some of the reformers have been used to kind of justify a liberal vision of society uh, where you have you have uh, so much distance between these two um, is is really a historical. I mean, it just doesn't work as I you know, my favorite subject, the New England Puritans. I mean, this is what they're doing, right? This is why they come here and they're not incongruent with with their friends back across the pond. The only people who aren't thinking about some vision of this, you know, of course, there's there's tweaks or there's differences, um, are, are people like Anabaptist, and that's why that they are that's why they're they're feared, they're you know disruptive and these sorts of things. But 
that's the radical Reformation tradition, right? If you're not part of that, if you want to be part of the main Reformed tradition, everyone thinks this way until the in late 18th century in their confessions, maybe mid 18th century. Um, and it's not, you know, fully worked out in, until later. So you, I think an interesting question for churches and Christians generally is to say, why, why don't we think that way anymore? That's actually a good is question. This, is, this, is this a result, as, as many want to think, this is pure theological development and that we've come to this, these conclusions for really pristine uh, sort of honorable reasons. And I don't think that's the case. So I think it's, um, I think it's outside influence that has brought you th there. And um, the second question would be, if figure out why you don't think this way, but then two, why are you so offended by people who do? And I think most Christians are, or, or they at least find it preposterous, preposterous right, to think this way. And to say, um, you know, to tell people at my like Presbyterian, I'm not going to be uh, disciplined for this, but to say I reject the 1787 edition er, negations in the Westminster standards regarding the magistrate, and I only adopt the 1646 is very bizarre. Why would you care about that, right? Um, so why do most people think that way? That's what they need to ask at this point. Um, do you have thoughts on that? If if we started this way mm. in the states. Mm. Um, what are the um, w what are the principles of erosion mm -hmm. that caused us to get where we are now? Yeah, I think I mean I think they could be numerous or maybe innumerable. Um, certainly, some of those are going to be because of um, political contingencies, because of course you do have dissenters and opponents uh, to these things. Uh, but to act like it's a natural sort of outgrowth of background principles that are rooted in Protestantism is the is my main issue, is to say no no no, the problem was the reformers you know, whoever uh, I already mentioned Vermeule you know whatever Wolfgang Musculus anybody you know continent you could have Junius you could have um, Zanke I mean whatever take your pick that that none of them thought about these issues, and that they're simply regurgitating. You know, holdovers from the holdover ideas from the Constantinian order, the medieval period, which is you're supposed to shudder when you hear those those words. Those are bad. Um, that I think is ridiculous. I think it's a ridiculous idea, considering how much they actually did write on these subjects. Um, and I know that that's probably the case because very few people are reading those kinds of texts on these on these topics. Um, so that's the main thing I want people to disabuse themselves uh, selves of. There could, we could talk much longer about okay, why did it did it erode? But I want people to deal personally or at a church level at least of why don't why don't we agree with that anymore? And I don't think they'll have a good answer mm -hmm. for that. And you're saying Protestantism is yeah. not one of the reasons for that no, dissolution. No, no, I that's don't think the, it's baked in. That's the main in. point you're wanting yeah, to say. Yeah, I don't think it's baked in. You don't find. I mean, so forget the reformers. Just look at the confessions. You don't find this in the Helvetic Confessions. You don't find, I'm, I'm meaning the, the assumption now, you don't find this in the Westminster Confession and, and take your pick of the rest of them. Mm -hmm. The same statements on the magistrate or, or s similar statements and his religious interest is there. And this is partially, not to digress too much, because the ref, part of the reformer reformers' efforts throughout the 16th and 17th century is to recover the proper elevation and role of the magistrate contrary to what they see as late medieval or mid to late medieval papal innovations. And so instead of having two swords or two powers that are um, in many ways coordinate, later popes, I mean, the Baxter and Vermeule blame different people, whether it's uh, Gregory VI or Innocence III or whatever, but they blame someone, some late medieval pope that will, that they think elevated the papacy above the, the magistrate not in terms of difference in competency, but in terms of the power no longer coming directly from God to the magistrate, but through the papacy or through the church to the magistrate, meaning it can be rescinded at will, right? And that you can uh, contest its function. And so you're no longer coordinate. There's a hierarchy of the authorities now, whereas they would say um, the older tradition, certainly coming from uh, Pope St. Galasius or, or whatever, 
Um, and then in scripture, clearly indicates that the power comes not immediately, but directly from God to both powers. And so therefore they should be coordinate and agreeable. And they're wanting to restore that proper sort of balance as they do with so many doctrines that they want to get back behind medieval innovations that think are from the bad schoolmen. And so what they're, in many ways, you see them elevating the magistrate's religious role over and over and over again, because they're trying to rebuild that. And then the magistrate is also um, functioning for them, and they think properly has a reformist element to him. I mean, I think that I did my review on Stephen Wolfe's chapter on the Christian prince. I thought it was the best chapter and the most conventional one in terms of the tradition. And I think most people freaked out about it. And I think they should think about why they freaked out about it. Very standard stuff. Okay. Yeah. Let's do a, let's, let's, let's go this route. It seems to me there are two, two groups of people out there that would agree with the vision that you've just set forth. Sure. The Protestant vision. Yeah. Um, vision of civil reform. Mm -hmm. the acknowledgement in the Constitution of a state that uh, Jesus is Lord. And if you're going to be a civil magistrate around here, hey, you need to be. Mm -hmm. um, again, inside out, this is going to take time, patient, plotting, reformation, sure. all yeah. of that. But of the two people that get that vision, that I want to say are brothers and teammates, and I don't want you to split, stop it. Like I wouldn't, you know, um, maybe these two groups might have a tendency to hmm. throw down. And mm -hmm. I want to say, hey, now, yeah, yeah, hey, let's all get together. Um, would be the natural law, mm -hmm. magisterial re reformer types, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and these uh, Kuyperian mm. you know, presuppositional. Mm -hmm. Um, biblical theonomic types. Hmm. I'm finding that these are kind of two. Is is there is there tension in the room? First of all, with these two groups, is there are there, is there some of this going on? Yeah, I think. So. I mean, so you would you would put the um, the Kyperians and theonomists together. Um, well, you think there's three. I think there's like three camps. Okay. Well, let's hear for, the three camps. That, I mean, be, well, yeah, I think you already might, mentioned all of them. I just I just see the. Um, you know, the sort of neo-Calvinist Kyperians seem to be a, a camp. And then theonomists, maybe some theonomists uh, today, uh, like Kuiper, use Kuiper. But I do I do see them as a uh, as a different sort of group. Okay. Let's yeah. take all three. All give, three. Give us a yeah. quick, give us, give us your quick, describe them, draw them in cartoon form, each one. Cartoon form, sure. Each one. Yeah. And then, um, then tell them all that are listening why they need to get along and be friends and work this thing out together. Well, we may we may disagree on that. Oh, but, uh, no, no, no. Okay. You're um, with your friend. You're very, you're very <laughs> ecumenical. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, the, the magisterial guys who, you know, I would count myself in that, in that sort of clan, uh -huh. um, I, th I think are just, you know, it's self, dis it's in the name, but you're just appealing to the magisterial tradition. I think everyone... Um, you know, I, I know it's recognized because some of our Baptist friends will say, I just depart from that, right? So it's uh -huh. it's what we see in the magisterial reformers, and I would say their progeny. Um, and it's much of the stuff I've already been discussing. Now, the theonomist, um, you know, would be those, that, I mean, I was just debating this with the cross-politic guys, but they, I would say the key distinguishing quality of theonomists. And if you don't believe this, I think the labels start becoming very porous and almost superfluous. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe that the civil or judicial Old Testament law is readily transferable to any social context, and in fact, is the only just standard for doing so, thus and no further, and without a biblical textual referent for a law, you can't have it, then you're not a theonomist, and you should stop using the term. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and this is this, this is, is hard, the only thing. This will be hard okay. copy. This will be copy paste, yeah. old and new. And More you're or saying, less. You got to like, do that to be a like. Theonomist. I get their whole thing of like it's incremental, whatever. Okay, but that's like the vision. That has to be the vision. If you if you don't say that, then I'm not sure what the term means anymore. So that's theonomist. And let me just say, yeah. and put a little side note in. Yeah. What are there like three people in the United States that believe that? I have no idea. I, right. I, I, not many. I'm, I'm already going practical in a minute, but I just want to note there that yeah, I, I think it's like three people in the not. States. I mean, I that. apparently can't meet one as I was found out today. So anyway, the and so then the I would say the Kyperians, the, this is probably the most squishy category because I think, as you're saying, you know, many people appreciate Kuiper or um, you know, increasingly Bob Inc., but he doesn't do as much. So Kuiper's your guy. Um, but I would say the true Kuyperians, I mean, you hear this like on the on the podcast Grace in Common. Those guys are like real Kuyperians, neo-Calvinists. They're they're doing the thing. 
their program is is what they themselves will call. So I know I'm not misrepresenting them as sort of um, you know Christianized secularism. And the problem is like when you get it the other way around, or a Christian uh, a Christian pluralism. And it seems to me to be an adaptation, over adaptation to if we're in Kuiper's world, you know, the late 19th, early 20th century in the uh, in the Netherlands, and we would say if you're applying it today, um, it's baptized liberal truisms is the only way. That's not a nice way to put it, but it's the best way I know to put it. So you're you're basically saying, yeah, yeah, yeah this the structure is basically good. A liberal structure is good, uh, heavy on proceduralism, heavy on some of these generally liberal values, but just with a sort of Christian flair um, is is the best way I know know how to put them. And so I think that's another camp. They're not they're not averse to Christian to engagement with the public or society. That's good. Um, most of their weapons though are through persuasion. Right, because that's the the sort of key value for a liberal society is nothing can be done by force um, except sort of harm principle ethic that you you see in these guys. So don't pick the pocket; otherwise, everything else must be done through uh, persuasion. Um, so, and and they're often called the transformationalists for this reason. But they, uh, I don't even know if that's that's as fair. Um, but that's how I that's how I basically read them. Um, so those are your three camps, and there's, some, I think, some stark disagreements here because the the magisterial reformer guys, maybe there's only three of us too, I don't know, but they, <laughs> um, so we may be having like a nine person debate, I'm not sure, but the you can see why I want everyone to be friends. You know, there's only, only nine of them. Yeah. yeah, we can't even we can't even feel you know. So, uh, you know, the magister we're very very comfortable with with natural law, the natural law tradition. In fact, we think that's essential to um, our project and our and our thought. Um, and it's in all of our the guys we're, we're reading and stuff. Uh, theonomists, in general, I think, are skeptical of natural law. Um, this is another reason why the so-called general equity theonomists, it just doesn't make sense, because general equity, as it is in the confession, is just a synonym or a, a term of art for natural law. Okay, so Or a general equity theonomy might be, you know, the, might be the way forward to keep everybody on team. I don't think so. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right. And so, the, and then you have the the Kuyperians. You know, they're they're fine with a certain. A lot of them adapt a sort of stranger new new ad, uh, expressions of of natural law, but it doesn't seem to be the main um, thing they're engaging. But their but their real beef is going to be with with our convictions about establishment um, on the magisterial side, and of course, what they would what they would call maybe a biblicism on the theonomy side. The theonomists are going to critique them in the reverse fashion, and then both of those camps aren't going to like the establishment in the way that we would express it, and especially an overactive uh, state, as I would have it, if, from the viewpoint of a theonomist or maybe a Kuyperian as well. So there's a lot of fundamental problems. So your state's going to be a little overactive, is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's because I call you uh, time Klein Lord Protector. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. But... Um, <laughs> But what the way you just broke down the divisions, mm -hmm. if I come back again and say, hey, guys, are we all good with the Constitution acknowledging the Lordship of Christ? Mm -hmm. And I get confirm, <laughs> confirm, confirm. Yeah. And I say, are we all good with um, the culture around here? And mm -hmm. eventually in the Constitution itself is got to be Christian, got to be baptized in the triune mm -hmm. name. If I get good, 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 don't I have everyone on team? Yeah, I don't think you'd get good, good, good though. Who's going to say no? So I think the, um, I think you're going to immediately get pushed back on what are the what are the means of implementation. So you will hear a lot of people that I would, whether they're self-professing or not, would generally throw into the Kuyperian category of a, uh, and maybe it's just a default category, but it's a it's a sort of neo-Calvinist approach to things. Um, they will be fine with, as I see, as I read them, they would be fine with recognition of, of God in your state constitution if everybody's on board. So it needs to be this sort of democratic, you know, crowdsourced aspect of total buy-in. Um, they, they would otherwise see anything else as a major imposition um, that, and an improper one. Um, theonomists generally tend to be libertarians, so you have problems there with what you're going to enforce, and maybe they'd be fine with that general aspect. Um, but they also don't typically want establishments, in, in my experience, in the real sense that I'm talking about. So those are both those are both problems, I, as I see it. Um, one, they're going to be both parties would be concerned about the means of getting there, uh, where I would be less so. Um, or think less, uh, I would have a, a lower threshold for what's required to get there. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then, and then two, they might not, I don't even know if they would accept that outcome. So I think these, I think these are real divisions that further illustrate we're in the ideal stage now. So to work some of these things out. I could be, I could be ignorant of, mm -hmm. um, of the Kuiperians of which you speak. Mm -hmm. And as I, I, and you, you, um, anyone's read your stuff, you, you've written prolifically on this, but my guess is at least the way that term is used broadly mm -hmm. is very much like the theonomy distinction that you made earlier. Mm -hmm. Like people call themselves theonomists and they're just talking about God's law and they're talking about we need civil yeah. reform. Yeah. And I think we use Kuiperian and somebody's I've worked through pro reggae and I like what I read, uh, generally speaking. Sure. So, so yeah, yeah. people are going to have, yeah. so my guess is I, but aside from that, I think you are right. Mm. It's about means of implementation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where, man, the spirit, the spirit greases the wheels. That's, that's why sure, I think, sure. yeah. um, the, uh, the continual dialogue, is important because mm -hmm. if there's going to be civil reformation, mm -hmm. then we're going to need all three of those horses. If you would, whatever title you give yourself, and maybe yeah. some of you would give yourself one or two or none, but this, it seems to me, the, even the way you've isolated the ideal yeah. Yeah. is something that people could get on board from from a variety of um, avenues. Yeah, you'd need them and some, some besides, you know, obviously, some that maybe don't even fall into these camps to really... Right. To really do this, but that uh, that's why it takes takes time. And the yeah, I would agree with you that there's um, you know I'm not I'm not trying to target people that are like oh I've I've read some you know whatever the lectures on Calvinism and I kind of like Kuiper or something. That's not what I, I, I want to target. I, I do mean the people. I actually think it is uh, now within even Presbyterian circles the predominant position because the easiest one for uh, someone conditioned by a liberal society to accept. In fact, that's what it's meant to accommodate. So it is the default position as I see it for even theologically astute uh, and studious people. Um, and so that's that's usually like my main target is to sort of shake that um, out of people's heads to some extent. It's not that there's nothing useful about any of that, that thought, but um, I do see it, that persuasion going the opposite way it's it's an attempt at, at accommodation as i see it rather than um domination you might say or whatever you want to you know hmm. put put on there so I, what i'm interested in with the recovering the magisterial tradition is to challenge the you know general assumptions which are as i encounter people there's basically two buckets anyone has which is like normal or theonomist and so i have no bucket you know they but they're just told okay and theonomy bad right obviously that's like most people um, so it's to, it's to broaden the Overton window to where it traditionally was. Mm -hmm. And it's also to shake people out of their assumptions and force them to, to ask themselves why they think certain things when it's incongruent with the, the testimony of the tradi tradition, which by the way, was well thought out by much smarter people and exegetes than we can be. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's the main part of the project. And then the other part of it is to, to understand what America was actually like um, as it was started in the 17th century up through the 18th century, mm -hmm. which can also be instructive because it tells you about um, something about your your own people. And I think most Americans, I mean, this is why we still have our history wars, the 1619 Project, whatever. We know that our history matters for determining our, our character and nature um, as, as a people. So it's very important to get this right. I think most Americans are generally responsive to that and want to in some way not violate that. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to make sure those narratives are correct as well so that they're appropriately instructive, Yeah. Um, especially for statesmen who want to be prudent according to the populace that they they govern. Right. Yeah. Um, this has been such a good conversation, Tom, and very helpful. Maybe before we sign off, mm -hmm. just some books and or articles that you would you would – flag if people wanted mm -hmm. to follow up on this i think i've read i think it's mark david hall did america have a christian founding because mm -hmm. you mentioned the kind of a we need some resources on on american yeah history yeah, yeah. um you write an american reformer so you want to sure. go to american reformer you can find a bunch of articles there any other yeah. books or articles that you signal yeah so i think um one thing i always encourage people to do um is to read election sermons from uh, from New England in the 17th and 18th century, I think these are um, indispensable public documents. And so, an election sermon, you know, if you're, it's it's not about the doctrine of election. These were on election day every year. Um, 
in the various various colonies in New England, but predominantly Massachusetts um, and Connecticut, uh, less to the less extent in Plymouth, and then later there it's practiced as well in New Hampshire and Vermont and a few other um, areas. So what they are is the, the one particular minister would be asked annually by the General Assembly to come and preach at the on the day of election of the new governor and assembly, and um, they demonstrate you know, the, the general principles of, of politics that were ingrained in that part of the country at the time and the relationship relationship between church and state and these sorts of things in a very pastoral, biblically informed way, um, but a way that was uh, repeated over and over and over again. And then these these documents were read by everybody. They were would be printed at the expense of the General Assembly. They were discussed by other people. Um, they were uh, you know, in a time when a sermon, as Harry Stout talks about, was the predominant means medium of communication, not you know, unrivaled by television in terms of its circulation and impact, um, and everyone in New England is listening to sermons their whole life. Uh, these are super important. So I encourage these are all available online. You don't need to you know to buy these. They're you can just start googling them, and you should people should read them to understand America. So that's those are primary sources, and people should do those. Read state constitutions. Those are also online. Those are interesting documents for these questions we're talking about um, in terms of what and draw, you know, draw your own conclusions. I think it's pretty, pretty easy to do. So those those are the primary sources. Others would be like other primary sources in the reform tradition would be those that have recently been republished. I mentioned Junius already, you know, Matthew Hale's On the Law of Nature, uh, Zanke, um, you know, Reed Philip Melanchthon. Um, Niels Hemmings and all these have, are being republished about um, ideas on virtue, ethics, you know, morality, and natural law, government, politics. I mean, these are, this is kind of the the wheelhouse of things that are now being republished, and people should just read them and then read your confessions. I mean, so all that's a pretty easy program, all very accessible and all primary documents, and then then go read your secondary analysis before you get too caught up in those narratives. Very good. Yeah. Tommy Klein, thank you so much for joining me here on Reformation Thanks, Revival. Man.